Welcome to r and I'm Shay Howell, and I had the pleasure of talking with Larry R.L., co-founder of the Marcus Graham Project. It may be hard for some to believe that one movie in 1992 sparked a pipeline of Black talent into the industry and became the impetus for the work Larry and his co-founder, Lincoln Stevens, began over a decade ago. We talked about the growth and success of MGP's flagship program, I Create Boot Camp, and Locomotus, their on-demand network of Black agencies and talent in marketing and media. Oh, and you won't believe what's in his playlist. Let's get into it with Larry R.L. Rhythm and blues. There's a stat, according to the census, that we would not see equality in the advertising industry until the year 2079. If it takes until my kids' kids, then I didn't do my job. I'm not comfortable with that. The Rhythm and Blues Podcast. Well, thank you so much, Larry Yarrell, for joining me on R&B, which is Rhythm and Blues, where we celebrate the rhythm and analyze the blues of Black culture through the lens of marketing and advertising. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm great. Thank you for having me here. I truly appreciate it. You are the co-founder of the Marcus Graham Project, which we are absolutely going to dive into a bit shortly, and also Senior Enterprise Account Executive at Spectrum. So you've got quite a bit on your plate. We're going to talk about how you do all of that also. Yeah, I took about <laughs> 10 full-time jobs, you know. Hey, it's, that's what it's we do. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got right. it. So I like to start the podcast with when was the last time you felt represented? I have to say, honestly, it was during Obama's first campaign. I think that's the last time that I, I felt organically connected to. And it was less about, you know, being a proud uh, Black American man. I just felt proud to be, to be connected to so many other individuals, whether they looked like me or not, and just felt I think that's the most human I've ever felt, you know? Um, yeah. Just the synergy of, of, of everything. Uh, and, and, I, and I don't know if it was necessarily him or just the people who connected with him that I in, in return connected to, but that's the last time that I felt um, that I felt that organic, you know, unforced. Um, I didn't have to look for anything. It, it was just there. That was a palpable time, um, not just a big time in history, but for our culture, for yeah. Black people around the world. It was an amazing sight to see the world celebrate a Black man in that oh, way. Man. Like like never before. I'm sure we all felt like, is this really happening? Like, is right. this for real, for real? Yeah, I was actually, um, so uh, a few of my business partners uh, did some work with uh, Rock the Vote during that time. Okay. And so uh, election day, or the day before and election day, election eve, I guess, uh, we flew to Chicago and, we, you know, did some work with Rock the Vote. And that morning, you know, we were driving uh, elderly people to the polls and, you know, doing our, our community, you know, diligence, right? Yeah. And then that, and that night, we actually went to Grant Park for, you know, the celebration. And so we were there, you know, I mean, amongst the people. Um, Right. I I remember um, we we had pretty good uh, seats from a, from a good friend of ours. So we were in like the press area, um, you know, standing there with the likes of Spike Lee and Jesse Jackson and Oprah and Tom Hanks and Brad Pitt, people like that. Who were literally in tears, you know, um, and but they were no different from every the thousands of people who were standing out there. Right. I, I, that's a feeling I'll I'll never forget that, you know, I'll yeah. never forget that. It's making me like happy on the inside now, but also <laughs> sad right. because I miss him so much. Right. I miss right. Him so it's much. Like, bro, I feel like it's like Jordan, like bro, just lace them up one more time and. <laughs> Just Could step you back please? on the court for us, please? You know? Could you please? And every time we see him, he's just as cool and Man. seems just as happy. It's like deep. Unrattled. <laughs> Completely. Unrattled. Poised. 
perfection. Yeah. Absolute perfection. A lot has happened in 2020, period. Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> we we started the year off rough. There was oh, this is a oh, this is a year? I'm sorry, I thought this was a decade. You've been Listen. In, been a hell of a century. <laughs> Listen, things are moving so fast, it's hard to keep track of actual time. Right. Most recently, there was a global awakening that Black Lives Matter actually means just that we believe Black lives should matter to everyone. Of course, right. they matter to us. So there are a variety of different conversations um, and actions from brands and corporations and individuals. And this is unlike anything that we've seen in our generation. Right. And you sit on the corporate side. You also sit on the side of Marcus Graham. How are you doing? How has this been for you? I will say up until maybe a week and a half ago, um, it was just overwhelming, you know, I mean, that's really, that's really the only feeling I had. I, I felt overwhelmed in like every capacity, you know, thinking about, um, a, just the, the moment, right. The moment itself, what, what got us to this moment was right. overwhelming, right. Think about the casualties, um, absolutely casualties of the cause, you know, so what got us there was overwhelming. Then this immediate just surge of, of action items, you know, from you name it. I mean, all of a sudden right. everybody had, you know, things that they had to do. Corporations and brands and agencies had things that they had to do and money to do it with out of, out of yes. thin air, you know, thought we were Absolutely. in a pandemic. Well, well apparently not. <laughs> no, you got to find it from somewhere. Right. And, and yeah. then it's like, I don't really consider MGP, Marcus Graham Project, to be activists, but we are, we are, we activate, right? Um, right. We're not activists, but we are activating something. So from that standpoint, it's like, okay, what, what do we need to do? All right. Not that we haven't already done, you know, because we've been, we've been sitting at these tables for 12 years now, tooting right. this horn, like, okay, this is a real thing, you know. The images that we see of us, you know, blah, 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 on and on and on. Yeah. Now the emails are blowing up and the, you know, my LinkedIn is like, I looked at my LinkedIn today and was like, I don't even know where to start. So there's that part that's overwhelming. Then from a personal level, I have three children, mm. you know, my oldest, my daughter, Lane, my two sons, Lennox and Lucas, seven, five, and two. Um, overwhelmed with just, you know, anxiety. How do I explain all of this that's happening? Do I explain all of this that's happening? Right. Um, what is my responsibility to them as a parent, uh, to my greater community, you know, the neighborhood that I live in, my family, et cetera. It just, it just felt like a lot. Like I said, about two weeks ago, we just kind of got out. We just said, you know what? Let's just start here. Let's start. Let's do what we've what we've been doing. Start somewhere. Um, have a goal in mind, and we'll iron out how we get to that goal uh, as we as we move along. You know. I have a 18 year old son who's preparing to go to college. So we were already in the midst of what does the fall look like in the middle yeah. of COVID 19, and then all of this happened. Um, and we were already in the midst of managing um, some racial incidents that took place on his campus in February. The campus so, that he's going to or the high yes, school campus? The campus that he's going to. Okay. So it was just a lot. I think, yeah. um, you know, trying to rally around the people that you, you work with and be a support to your community and to your mm -hmm. point, what should I be doing? And at what point, you know, am I taking care of myself in the middle of that because it it absolutely was a lot so one thank you for all that you have done and are doing with the marcus graham project so let me just take a pause and i don't know that there is anybody in our generation who has walked into this industry 
that has not been impacted, affected by, saw, or made their decision based upon Boomerang. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's like I remember being younger and thinking, I, I don't know that I'd seen that level of professional people right. that were Black in one space. Right. And the mere fact that it was a movie didn't it, like that completely went over my head. Right, it was just right. like, oh, wait a minute. Real life. <laughs> Even this though it's Eddie real? Murphy, this is real life. <laughs> this is where I need to be. Okay. Whatever they're doing, I need to be doing this. Right. Um, so let's talk about how you all came up with it. What's your origin story for the Marcus Graham project? It really is that is exactly what you said. Um, for myself and my business partner, uh, Lincoln Stevens, um, you know, two uh, young black boys growing up in Dallas, Texas, um, probably had no business watching Boomerang at the time, but for whatever reason, we were uh, or did at some point in time. And that was our introduction into, you know, what we saw a beautiful industry, you know, a right. place where um, we could create, where where our creative minds could be used, you know, to tell stories and build brands and, and make money. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. so um, it's incredible to think like what it does for just the ability for someone to see an image that, re that is a reflection of them, to see a, a person of color, a black man doing something like that sparked an entire generation of, of, of black individuals saying, I want to do that. You right. Know, I want to go into that. And really, so, you know, that, that sort of um, anticipation going into the industry that you're going to, you know, go and, and be Marcus Graham. Um, and then you get in there and you realize, well, damn, I'm really the only one in here. Like, where, yeah. where's all those, where is the rest of those people that I saw in the movie? You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's a, it's a blow. And for, for many of us, unfortunately, that's what, that's what took us out of it. You know, that's that pressure mm -hmm. of being the only one there or not yeah. having the mentorship to help us navigate those situations or um, the confidence and, and, um, not necessarily just the seed, but the water to water that seed to go out and start something ourselves, like the agency, you know, that 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 uh, Marcus Graham was a part of. Seeing that, you know, it, it was discouraging to know that. And so um, Lincoln and I were, we were in communication and early on in our career, just sort of talking about the challenges that we were experiencing. I initially started my uh, agency career with a small agency in New York called Pierce. And um, Verizon was my client at the time. You know, I was just having a conversation with my buddy, like, man, you know, I'm in here with these folks, <laughs> you know, these folks. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is just, it's just different, bro. You know, I, I don't, I, I, there, has, there has to be something that I can do, you know? Right. Uh, who can I talk to? Who can I go and speak with? How can I bring more people? How do I even bring this topic up to my superiors, superiors and say, um, you know, it's a concern of mine, but not in an aggressive way, but just right. to say, how can I help this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and just going through those conversations, it was a mentor that came back and said, well, listen, you know, if you see a problem, it's not going to get fixed until somebody decides to fix it. And, um, and that's really, that's really what birthed the Marcus Graham project. Initially, Lincoln and I had created something just to, just to bring people of color in the industry together. And really at the time, specifically, it was black men because we were the most underrepresented portion of the, of the advertising industry. Right. So it really was just to create a network of, of black men that could, um, mentor each other, um, and sort of just you know, feed, feed our, our careers together, right? And help navigate our careers together. Mm -hmm. And eventually, um, you know, we created what was like uh, the, what is the I Create Summer Boot Camp, right? 
which is our flagship program. It grew from the network to now we want to train people. We want to get people interested in the industry. That's the only way we, we got to infiltrate the industry in order to see that change, right? Right. So let's get people of t- different talents and show them what they can do with those talents inside of the media marketing and advertising fields. Um, created the uh, I Create Bootcamp and um, which is essentially our summer, our 10 week summer program, 10 to 12 week summer program, where they create like a pop-up advertising agency, right? We bring in people from mostly from over the country, but we have some, had some people from out of the country as well. Um, they're from all over the world. They fly them here to Dallas. It's like the real world of advertising. <laughs> How they awesome. live, yeah, they live together, they work together. And we find them real clients to work on. A lot of them are fresh out of college, so they don't have, they have portfolio work, but it's from school. You know, it's not right. real clients. So this gives them an opportunity to put themselves in front of real clients, in front of real agencies who are mentoring them throughout the process and put their work out there. And a lot of it goes to print or, you know, to a spot on TV somewhere or whatever. Sort of fast forward to 12 years. Now we do that in three different cities. Um, we have truncated versions of that in, in the form of a workshop. Uh, five-day to two-week workshops in six different cities, and we're servicing quite a few individuals in the industry now. And we kind of see ourselves as as like a little army, you know. Uh, we just go in, smash and grab the place, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> people leave our program, and they feel like, I'm, per- I'm saying this because it's been told to us, they, they feel like they've, they've learned more in the time that they spend with us than they do, you know, during a four-year degree. And, and they want to now go to whatever agency they work at, spread the good news and pull somebody up as well and say, hey, you know, this is, this is an incredible program, you know, plug into the Marcus Graham Project in some way, some form, some fashion. That's essentially us, right? It's fantastic. The way that the program started with just being able to identify with Marcus Graham and then for you all to duplicate duplicate that in so many ways for people to be inspired and encouraged. And because at least for me, growing up in the business, I got a chance to do that under the wing of people who look like me. And working on business from my culture was extremely helpful. It is um, something that you can't really describe. And I knew then Uh, or didn't know then what I know now is that that was such a unique experience. Mm -hmm. And so for them to start their careers in that way is it's special. It's really special. And it helps to cultivate not only who they become professionally, but the way that they navigate the spaces that they will be in Mm -hmm. and impact those spaces for them to be better. So for sure. You know, the crazy thing is that most of our participants now, when they come in, they have no idea that Marcus Graham is from the movie Boomerang. Boomerang. I was going they, to ask you that because they're much younger. Have, they're so much younger. And, and that and that really, it dates, it dates us because when we first started the program, everybody knew who he was. Right. You know? Yeah. And now, like I'd say like the last five years of the program, it went from like half of them knowing, and now it's like nobody knows. And wow. so we're like, they just think that's just the name of the program. You know? Wow. <laughs> so we wow. In, the, in the first week, we normally have them watch the movie and uh, right. get familiar <laughs> with, with why we named it Marcus Graham. Project. Marcus Graham. Absolutely. That's your homework. You have to do that first. Yeah. You said your LinkedIn was jammed. What has the organization been experiencing since uh, we've arrived at this racial awakening? How we operate, you know, as an organization, we're a nonprofit, right? We look to the agencies, partnership with the agencies and brands to really do everything that we do. Um, So that's really what we spent the last 12 years doing is finding uh, alignment with agencies and, and brands who have the same sort of mission of of, um, addressing diversity and and inclusion and equity, more importantly, Mm -hmm. into their space, right? They they recognize an issue and they want to address it through our program in some way, form or fashion. A lot of those conversations just candidly, you know, we've been in these rooms, been at the table enough to know almost immediately when we start the conversation, 
is this organization doing this because they're looking to check a box or do they actually believe this is good business practice? Right. right. So what has happened in the last month or so, I will say six weeks or so, is that many of those organizations that we sat in front of who either passed on the opportunity to work with us or maybe they didn't treat the opportunity the way they should have, have come back to say, recognize the need right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's time essentially, you know? And so, you know, for a lot of those conversations, it's like, okay, great. But we're allowing them to take the lead before it was us. You okay. know, we were the ones pressing all the buttons. Now we're in a position where no, you do the work. Yeah. And we'll tell you if that work is headed in the right direction or not. <laughs> okay. You know, and I, and I think that's important because if you want it to feel authentic, mm -hmm. it's important that it's, it's no longer us partnering with you. It's you partnering with us. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And that's really what's, what's been happening. You know, we've, I'm thankful, you know, it's, it's a good problem to have, you know, people, organizations literally just coming out of the woodworks, you know, to say, what is MGP? How can we be involved, et cetera. And it is to a point now where we, we're having to say, you know, we really don't have the bandwidth for that. You know, it, it, it mm -hmm. needs either it needs to be at this level or, you know, we'll, there's other organizations who we, we can recommend you to. You know what I mean? You all have some pretty big news to land in Forbes over the weekend. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's cool. A little something. <laughs> just, a, just a little something, you know. Cool. It was cool. Yeah, yeah, a little something. So I want to make sure I say it right. Locomotives? Mm -hmm, that's correct. So talk to me a little bit about what that is, what you're doing with it. I'll give you an example, and this will tell you why Locomotives exists. So a couple of years ago, um, our summer program, uh, their client, one of their clients was Hennessy. And um, part of their brief was um, uh, coming up with a Black History Month campaign that they had been kind of been working on, but it really wasn't, you know, hitting the mark or whatever. And um, the team took that on throughout the summer, did a great job. Uh, Hennessy activated it. Uh, it kind of it ran for like the next 365 or whatever. And, and um, when it was over, Hennessy came back to us and said, hey, you know, how can we continue to work with this team? OK, well, cool. We've had that actually happen quite a few times. Almost every summer, somebody says something in that fashion. Right. Um, uh, Beats by Dre, Pepsi, AT&T, a couple that, had, that we've worked with that we've extended the work beyond the summer program. Well, early on, uh, some of our board members had mentioned, listen, you're going to get into, and this is really how we knew what success would look like when these questions started happening. You're going to get into a space where these brands and the individuals that we have working with them on, on our team are essentially their case study, right? They're, they're young, um, they're minorities, they're culturally relevant, you know, they're right. They're educated, whatever, all the boxes you, you're looking to check, right? Right. So for them to be able to work with them, it, it allows a brand or an agency to skip a step that they typically wouldn't be able to skip. And that's figuring out what, what's in the mind of that consumer. They have the consumer right there actually telling them this is what you should do. So that started happening more and more often. And this was three summers ago that they were working with Hennessy. Well, NEC came back and they were like, not only do we want to work with them, we want to put some legitimate money on the table to make it happen. Great. That's awesome. We don't have the infrastructure at the moment to facilitate that. Mm. So that got us wrapping, wrapping our minds around, you know, what we do with talent. We have this huge database, not just the individuals who come through our program, but just people who are part of the Marcus Graham Project Network. We have this huge database of individuals uh, of talented people who are, you know, working at certain agencies or freelancers or, you know, whatever, but it's a database. And these, these are individuals who most uh, brands and agencies are looking for. They're looking for them. 
So we started wrapping our heads around this. We actually made this announcement that we were going to do this two years ago uh, in the form of a company called Locomotives. And essentially what Locomotives was going to do was, or is, I should say now, is operate as a, I'm careful to, to, to place this, but it's the best way that I can explain it. But essentially one part staffing, right? So you need a particular type of talent. We have that one part staffing and then one part on demand agency. So if you're an agency looking for, let's say you've got a, a project that just comes up or a book of business that you just, that you just landed and you need an immediate startup agency or a start, or startup talent, right? To jump on that work. You can come straight to locomotives and we can piece that organization together for you. And it may just be, you know, one copywriter, one project manager, one graphic design, whatever is needed, but we can place that agency together for you. How do we do that? Well, it's what we've been doing for the last 12 years. Every summer, we've got another, we've had, we've had an agency in position. Right. Those individuals have now come back to us saying, we're ready when you all are ready. So you have those individuals who have actually been through our program, in addition to the individuals who are a part of our network, who we can place into these one stop into this one stop shop uh, vehicle where we can essentially jumpstart an agency in about five days. And it's all wow. run through locomotives as the agency. But, you know, you, I kind of look at it like a uh, like Voltron. If the arm is like four or five people over here, and, and that's all you need right now is just the arm. And then right. you've got, you know, the leg is, you know, six or seven people. And then, you know, my machine gun is another seven to 10 people or whatever, whatever you need, we can place them and put them in, in strategic positions to perform the work that needs to be done. Or if you just need a, you know, one off hire, I need an art director, you know, we can do that too. So um, the, the funny thing for us was that, you know, we were looking for little spaces where this existed and there are some things that are similar, but nothing for us. Nothing that nothing right. that, that houses talent that looks like us. Right. So that was the difference. And honestly, you know, if, if we're going to say, you know, not you know, everything else is everything you read is saying, you know, now's the time black lives truly do matter. Well, it's got to matter in every space, you know, not, not just on the streets, under law enforcement, not just, you know, in political arenas. It needs to matter where we can have seats at the table, where we see our images, where we can make money, where we can be uh, masters of our own fate, you know? Right. Um, and so all of that is, it's, it's all interlinked and we're just trying to do our part with it. To that point, I have thought, I don't know how many times, you know, you have your traditional agencies where you, you know, you need to go through the process, but what right. if you just need a copywriter? Right. right. Then you're you're searching your own personal network, trying to find someone. And there's more than enough talent in the industry that is African-American that, you know, aren't getting the opportunities that they should um, because of the way that the industry kind of operates, which is the way that the world <laughs> for the most part operates. But this gives the industry overall a space to come to. And that is extremely exciting that you all be facilitating that so yeah. will people be able to hit you up about that now or yes. is there an official launch date all right you're yeah. up and running. they can hit us up about it now locomotives.com is up we're still working on some back-end things we are of the mindset that and i'm sure you've heard this before you know in every professional setting that the plane is flying okay we Absolutely. might be missing some wheels you know <laughs> landing gear i don't <laughs> whatever right. but we don't really We've never operated that way. We didn't launch MGP that way. We mm -hmm. knew it was necessary, you know? Right. So that's it's that's the way we're looking at locomotives. It's necessary. It's going. It's going now. We'll, we'll figure out, and we're okay with, with admitting that to some people, you know, particularly clients that have come to us and saying, hey, there's kinks. We got, we know that. You know what I mean? Right. But we're hoping that people will latch on to us and be able to help us work out those kinks. Tell us where you know, where we can improve this, the, the processes and things like that to just make it a better organization. So I'm totally fine with that. And we're going to keep moving forward. 
you do all of that that we've been talking about. And then you also have a full time. I'm not even going to say nine to five because I know better. I know that it's more than nine to five at Spectrum. What are you doing with them and how are you managing the two of these things? Yeah, so, you know, I really look for uh, at Spectrum, I look for um, enterprise level business, uh, business partners. So, I mean, I've, I've been, I've been, let's see, I've been working in telecom. I went from, I went from the agency life to, um, to the brand side in 2008, 2009. 2009, I started working for Verizon, who was my client for a while. Um, and uh, so I've been on that side for, for since 2000, no, 2008, yeah, 2008. And I just happened to have stayed with telecom since then. So I've been kind of around the gauntlet with telecom, uh, Verizon and Frontier, AT&T and, and then Spectrum. So I, all the big players, pretty much seen everything there is to see inside of that space. And, and so now what I do is more, I would say it's more sales oriented where we look for new business. You know, we look for new business partners at a, at an enterprise level. So in, in around 400 employees and it's a different type of job, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's very different, but I think the rules are still the same that we, we win business by engaging people and understanding people and personalities, really. Yes, it is a full-time job. I'm lucky that I've had leadership that understands my passion and my purpose. So that when, you know, Larry is a little off the cuff at the moment, I have a little rope where I can, you know, yeah, it's okay. Hey, Larry, we need to reel you back in. Okay, no problem. I'll, let me get my stuff together. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I've always been this way. So I've always, I've never had one job. I mean, and honestly, those are my only two jobs. My wife, the office that I'm sitting in right now uh, is a co-working space that my wife and I own. So we also have been managing this for the last year or so. Um, and that's, that's, I've always been an entrepreneur. You know, I've, I've had more failed businesses than successful ones. I will not, not mm. ashamed to admit. Uh, but I've always been an entrepreneur and, and, you know, whether I've had a nine to five or not, I've always had something that was mine that I rely more on, more upon on than my nine to five. So many in the culture have found that some, uh, by necessity, others right. just by, <laughs> others just by nature, others yeah. just by nature. Um, so you have chose to stay in the industry for mm -hmm. quite some time now. Um, so you would be one of the success stories, right? A bit of a Marcus Graham, if you will. So what would you say has contributed to your success and who helped you along the way? I would say most greatly in terms of contribution to my success would be the individuals that I, I've aligned myself with. And it, it, I won't say that it's one person. It's a group of us, you know, particularly a few individuals that I went to college with that we've all sort of been our biggest competition and our biggest supporters. It's not necessarily trying to one up each other, but it's, but it's definitely like, okay, who's next, you know, right. Who's, yeah. who's going to take the next shot. You know what I mean? And it's, and it's a very healthy encouragement where healthy encouragement and competition where we don't see each other as threats that we just see each other as, as um, men and women who are, who are trying to do better than their parents did and, you know, be an example for their children and communities and just, you know, just do good things. So yeah. I would say that would be probably the, the greatest contribution, but I would also have to say, you know, watching my parents work as a child is invaluable. And I think my, my parents were the type of parents that didn't, they didn't just go to work and come home they actually explained to me what they did, you know, okay. how they worked. And I remember, you know, being in the office with my mother, she was a site manager for Xerox. Before that, she was, well, she was the first black female field engineer for the wow. company. Wow. Yeah. 
So I remember her taking me like out on these trips because she was at the time she's a single parent, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, in the summertime it's hard to find childcare. So <laughs> she was like, a "Hey, field trip, to, right? <laughs> it's field trip time. <laughs> have to ride in the back of this back of this truck and uh, you know help me with these parts and stuff." <laughs> so, yeah, but just understanding that you know how you work, the level of, of focus, you know, just to go to work and do a good job every day. My dad, you know, he was an entrepreneur himself. My dad owned a karate dojo in, in West Texas. Wow. Right. So, um, you know, he was a sensei and that's, I grew up in the dojo and I still take some of the things that, you know, that he would teach discipline, desire, dedication, determination. Those are the things that I wake up with every single day. Um, but just seeing how my dad was able to connect with people just in, in, in the area that we lived in West Texas, El Paso, was pretty much 99.9% .9 Hispanic. It's very hard for a non-Hispanic to have a successful business amongst an all Hispanic community, right? And my dad was successful because he knew how to connect with people, learn the language, you know, learn the customs, learn the culture, and you know, just be a part of the community. And that's what made his business successful. So um, just sort of understanding that. And then the last thing I would say, or if I could contribute it to one person, that person would be culture in general. Mm. I spent um, a few years overseas and tra I did a lot of traveling as a young adult. And that really changed how I view the world and how I view people and my ability to connect with people on, on multiple levels. What would you like to see a manifest as we journey through this time, right? Because it's not just our racial awakening. It's not just what this time of COVID-19 has taught us about ourselves, about right. our families. It's been a very introspective time for those who are really paying attention to reflect mm -hmm. on kind of where you are and what you want. Um, what would you like to see on the other side of this for the industry? For the industry, I think more than anything is a mirror. I really just want, you know, you talked earlier about the authenticity of, of the decisions that we make, right? Wanting, wanting those decisions to be authentic and wanting them to feel organic. That was the word you used. Right. Organic, right. Um, and I, I really just, I really want the industry to, to have like this permanent mirror that it walks around with um, so that they can see themselves and we can see ourselves for what we are, the power that we have, um, and the purpose that we have. If there's nothing that we've done as individuals, if you've done nothing else during this time, most of us are at home, you know, we've reflected. So, but I think we all have to remember this is as much as we keep saying, you know, is this our new normal? Let's be real. We are not going to be stuck at home for the rest of our lives. It's just right. not going to happen. We, we won't put up with that. <laughs> right. No, at some right. point in time, we're going to go back to a fairly normal style of work, right? Yes. So will will that reflection in when that begins again? Right. And yeah. my hope is that it doesn't, that we maintain that mirror in front of us. And if we do that, we'll continue to do good work. But more importantly, we'll just be better people. Yes. You know, just, yeah. just better people. And so I, I think that's that's what I'm hoping for. That's what I see. I have, I'm cautiously optimistic about that. But yeah. I do, I do think we're headed in the right direction for it. Good. I do also. I do also. I think um, for me, it, that cautious optimism has, I think, given many of us the platform and the motivation we needed to, for some speak up, mm -hmm. for some show up, and to take this opportunity and create a momentum that can continue to move us forward yeah. um, because 
in any situation you have a, a space that you're tired or what we used to do is more comfortable. So of course we have a lot of work ahead of us and um, I'm cautiously optimistic also. Yeah. So how can black advertising, marketing professionals support Marcus Graham? I know that you guys have a donation campaign going on. Mm -hmm. What can we as a, a community uh, do to help support? Number of things you can plug in, all right? Um, join the network. I think that would be first and foremost, it's the easiest thing to do. Log on to www.marcusgramproject.org and sign up. Um, doesn't cost you anything. It's just saying, I want to be plugged into the information that uh, Marcus Graham is pushing out. I want to be plugged into the people. Um, I want to be a part of the organization in some way, form, or fashion. And that comes in different forms of fashion. You know, giving your time as a mentor, especially for someone like yourself, Shay, who is, you know, you've, you, you've been around this wheel. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, the, the, the individuals who are in our program this summer, there's 13 of them, um, they are so um, incredible. Mm. And I'm only using incredible just because I don't have another word at the moment, but right. they are incredible. If I had an ounce of what they had in my little pinky, <laughs> I would be a superhero myself, you know? <laughs> but they are just, the way their mind is, the way their mind works and how they think, you know, they're different from us. They are, I'm, and I'm okay with saying that. And I'm, you know, I, I think, I think as we get older, we always want to feel like our generation is yada, yada, yada. Yeah. But th there's no generation like the one that's, that's coming up and the things that they've seen you yes. know, and have endured through. Yes. They're going to be something else. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But my only fear for them is that because they've seen so much, that they won't lean on the eyes and the experiences of, of our generation or the generation before us, you know? Okay. So that's my only fear for them. So um, the, the mentorship, I think it, it has to continue and it has to get stronger uh, as we go along. So we're always looking for that. Um, obviously, financially, we don't have a program if we don't have no money. Right. Yeah. It's just, it's just yeah. the way it works, you know? Um, we, we've been really blessed that uh, we, we've had partners through brands and agencies who have come on. Um, last year, we had our biggest year. Uh, we raised uh, close to $900,000 last year. Awesome. Yeah. So, and because of that, we were able to be in more places. We were able just to do more. You know, we had, we went from having one flagship program or one I create boot camp to having three. And then we went to be to only do from doing three workshops to doing six, um, bringing on two full time staffers that could you know help me and my business partner out. You know, so things picked up. Um, but then 2020 came, and we literally had our worst year in six years in terms of raising funds. You know, yeah. There's a turn in all of that, right? There's a, sort of a perfect storm that that's happened since then that things, we know things will pick up, but I mean, it's just a fact of any nonprofit, especially those that are that are, are doing good work and we know that they are actually making a difference. It costs money to do it, you know? Yes. So a personal donation or a connection to uh, the department that writes the checks. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, um, <laughs> in, in whatever organization that you work for, that's another way that you can help out. There's a stat, according to the census that we would not see equality in the advertising industry until the year 2079. That can't work. Wait, wait, what? We would not see total equality in the advertising industry until the year 2079. Now I, I have kids. I'd love for maybe not all three, maybe just one of them to be interested right. in, in this business. But if it takes until my kids' kids 
then I didn't Good do my way. job. I, I didn't, I can't feel, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not right. accepting that. I'm not comfortable with it. That's not how we're rolling. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to need some more money to get it done. Um, and yeah. obviously it's not just us. Um, but we like to consider ourselves to be leaders and in, in championing the cause. So, um, yeah, so there's that. And then I would also say work, you know, we have proven as an organization that we can do good work. Right. So, you know, if there's a client out there that's looking for something different, try something different, you probably get a different result. Exactly. If there's a client out there that's looking for that and and wants to you know take a chance a very healthy chance on a uh, little old marcus grand project and or locomotives by all means please come our way there is one thing that is off topic but i wanted to get your perspective on this so the space that we're in mm -hmm. with brands responding the black lives matter movement there are a couple things that have been markers for me like completely blew me back not as if they weren't things that need to be addressed or things that needed to be handled but just the mere fact that we were finally talking about it just seemed like oh well okay one of those things was aunt jemima oh god <laughs> like wow never thought that anything would happen um yeah. in that space the next thing is the NFL and Colin Kaepernick. And I'm going to say that I am not a quote unquote football fan. Mm -hmm. I know more than enough people who are some who stay committed to watching the NFL through this others who completely walked away right. um, that were struggling and for there to be this new space where um, Black Lives Matter. Right. And there are so many symbolic things about Colin and the way that he protested and George Floyd and how we ended up here in this space. Mm. It's heavy. It's really, really heavy. But I wanted to put that on the table and kind of see if you had feelings or something that you wanted to share or thoughts about it, I should say. I'm going to take it just one. It's actually into what you said. Colin Kaepernick taking a knee in response to the injustices that happened to people of color, particularly black men and law enforcement. This insert bad word, whatever, mm -hmm. kneeling on George Floyd's neck, the piece, the part when I watched that video, the part that really, really struck a nerve, and, and I'll correlate this back to the NFL, was watching this officer kneel on him with his hand in his pocket, nonchalant, with his hand in his pocket, literally squeezing the life from that man. That's what the NFL was doing. They were keeping yeah. their hand in their pocket. Hmm. That's what they were doing. Wow. Let me hold on to my little change. You know, I'm keeping my hand in my pocket because I don't want to give up this, this, this cash cow, this money that might offend someone that might offend, you know, our, our quote unquote base. Right. That was the piece right there that brought me to tears. You know, I, I, I watched that whole thing a number of times. And when I, the time when I saw it and I noticed that his hand was, was in his pocket, that's when I was like, oh, you really don't care. Not at all. You really don't care. To correlate that to the NFL, um, I don't know if they actually care. I'm not sure. And I and, and it's probably not for me to decide either. Right. Um, I'm to the point in my life where I'm cool if you don't care. I'm fine with that but you're not going to treat me like you don't care. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. That, that's, that's where I'm at. Yeah. And I, and I, and I believe that that's the statement that those NFL players were making when they put out that PSA, the players coalition put out that PSA to Roger Goodell and 
the league office, basically saying, does it have to be one of us before you all understand this? Mm. Hopefully not. But either way, you are not going to treat us and our communities like you don't care. It's just the bottom line. You can feel yeah. however you want to feel because because we have no control of that, right? We can't, right. but we're not going to continue to work in this space and and feel like mm-hmm. you don't care. Right. So it's either show up and show out or we don't suit up. Now, part of that is, and I understand there are varying levels for NFL players um, in terms of uh, pay and things like that, but I do feel like they missed a really great opportunity when Colin was kneeling to band together as as an entire players association. They could have. I won't say that they should have, but they could have as a as a union said, we're not suiting up. Right. The impact that that would have had five years ago or four years ago on the league um, and the country would have been extreme. Yes. Because people people are crazy about their sports. They're literally nuts. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, there's a reason for all of this. And I'm, I'm hoping that we find, you know, solace in some of this in the end or whenever that will be. The NFL is another one of those situations where I'm like, mean side eye right now. <laughs> mean side eye. Really? Yeah. Really? You got yeah. it wrong? Real? Who? What was the wake up moment? Where? Like, who taps you on your shoulder and said, I think we messed this one up. When did that happen? When? When? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? For sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a big one. I think we're all waiting to kind of see how that completely plays out along with everything else. There's a, I'm sorry. But the, and there's oh. also this notion that if Colin Kaepernick get, gets – hired or you know brought on to a team Mm -hmm. that that will say that will mean they truly get i don't believe that i don't believe for one bit that colin kaepernick being an nfl quarterback means a hill of beans it means nothing Mm. it means in in my eyes colin kaepernick is once he becomes an nfl quarterback it's just an nfl quarterback they're all players in, in in the nfl right you know and that, that wasn't the purpose of all of this. Yeah. He's done miles of good outside of the NFL. Mm-hmm. You know, he used his platform uh, to, to speak on something that was important to him. But the result, the notion that him becoming a quarterback again makes this all right again is that can't be the that can't be it. It'd be great, sure, but that right. can't be it, you know? Yeah. And, as consumers of the game or just people in general who, who have a vested interest, we can't settle for that either. You know, right. That can't be the thing that we say, oh, I'm good now. I'm going to go to the games and watch the games or whatever, you know, that can't be where we stand. Yeah. Because that's not what he was fighting for. Absolutely. It's a different level of understanding where we land Mm-hmm. and what our role is in terms of participation or not participating. Right. Because for so long, we've had to go along to get along mm-hmm. um, and accept so many things that we didn't want to, that were uncomfortable. And now we're in a much better space that we can consider what we really are asking. Yeah. What are we demanding? What does it need to look like? What would make us more comfortable? What is acceptable? And to the point that we were uh, making earlier in the conversation that we have to continue to move forward and not fall back into what we know Mm -hmm. because that is the most comfortable space or no, you know, this is what I thought we wanted instead of pushing it further to stand in that space and, um, continue that level of accountability yeah. because that's also work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's that is some absolutely. Some so last but not least, I want to thank you so much for giving me um, an hour of your evening. This is a great conversation. I really, really appreciate it. And I am going on to the website and I'm going to sign up 
to do my part. I hope that everyone else does also. The podcast is called Rhythm and Blues. I want to know what you are currently listening to. Doesn't have to be Rhythm and Blues, Mm -hmm. but what are you listening to? Truthfully. (laughs) Why does everybody start that way? Like, am I going to tell the truth? Uh, You got to, you have to, you have to understand my house dynamic to understand what I'm going to say. (laughs) That means this is going to be a great answer. Oh, man. I'm mad that this is going to, I'm mad that this is going to be like etched in history when I say this. <laughs> um, what is it? Trolls World Tour soundtrack. <laughs> okay, listen. That is amazing. That is absolutely amazing. So the last podcast was with uh, Walter T. Gear III. He is the group creative director of uh, TBWA World Health. Yeah. And... He has a daughter who's four or five, Mm -hmm. and I'm trying to think, what did he say? It was some kitty something that he said he was listening to also, (laughs) so that is even more hysterical that all adults are listening to whatever their kids are listening to. It's so good, though. (laughs) It's so good. Get out of here. It's so good. Is it really, or have you just heard it a million times? No, 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 no. It's good. It's good. (laughs) So, I don't know. You haven't seen the movie. You haven't seen the movie. No. You have to see. I have not. The movie is actually really good. It it's a it's about without giving it all away. It really Mm -hmm. talks about the origins of of music and how all these different genres really stole music from us right that's what sort of the underlying that's sort of, that's sort of the underlining message from it right okay but it but but then the, it kind of brings it full circle to say music is also how we connect each other right right no matter what race culture whatever like it's how we all connect but so the soundtrack the troll soundtrack it has some like original sound original music and some some remakes and some stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm a, I'm like, I'm one of those people, I grew up on everything, you know? Yeah. Like old school hip hop, old school rock, country, jazz, all of it. So for me, this was like the perfect mix of stuff. And then it's just got <laughs> some really good artists on the soundtrack, some really great artists actually. So I recommend it. I know it's not your normal uh, <laughs> recommendation, right. you know? <laughs> But Trolls World Tour soundtrack is banging. And I will send you all, if you don't believe me, I will send you clips of my kids going nuts in the house to the soundtrack. The movie doesn't even be on anymore. We don't even play the movie anymore. We just play the soundtrack. Just the soundtrack. Just the soundtrack. I have got to check this out. I've got to check it out because you said that the Trolls World Tour soundtrack is banging. Okay. Banging. Now... That's a tall. That's a tall order. Okay, it's, so I'm I'm going in with high expectations. I, I realize what I'm saying. Like I'm not crazy. I realize what I'm saying, but I'm okay. saying trust your boy. <laughs> your boy. <laughs> I absolutely will. I'm going to check it out, uh, and I will let you know what I think. Okay, please do. <laughs> Well, thank you so much again, Larry. I greatly appreciate it. This was a great conversation. The end of this was amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank for you having so me. much. Where can everybody follow you or find you? Sure. You can find me on Instagram at what is my handle? God. Uh, my last name, Yarrell, Y A R R E L L I N H D, Yarrell N H D on Instagram, um, LinkedIn, uh, forward slash LYRL. Um, and if you really just need to contact me, then just hit Shay up and she'll give you my info. Okay. <laughs> now that I can do that, huh? <laughs> Thank you so much again, Larry. This was absolutely awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.